Um, Kurt's exactly right. Um, we all should have goals. And uh, whether it be the, to, to be your first 5K of your life, or half marathon, or your first try, or, or a multi-sport, whatever it is, you know, the, the goal of, of, one goal should be is get off the couch and get moving. And uh, that's what all these events are really designed to do. Um, if you go back 15 years ago, this is 2012, so you go back to 97, 15 years ago, and looked at running in Omaha at that time, I could almost stand at the starting line and give out the finishing award. <laughs> I knew who was in the race, I knew their time, that he would finish faster than him, you know, I could almost hand out the awards at the, at the starting line. And at that time, it was almost 70-30 men versus women. And now it's almost reversed. It's almost 30, I mean, 30-70 women versus men, men versus women. So there are more women participating in multi-sports and running these days than men. And that's good. Um, we all need to get active. Uh, whether it be with a charity, uh, some event like that, or just doing your first 5K, or try, or whatever it is. You know, like I said, get off the couch and let's all get moving. Um, I'm here to talk to you today about equipment. Uh, we're going to talk about shoes, socks, maybe some inserts, a uh, little bit about food, maybe a little bit on how to dress. And the big question of the day is, why do you stay away from cotton? So I'll let you, you know, let, stay away from cotton. Yeah, so I'll let you think about that a while as we go through our presentation. And then may come up in a question later on. Um, running shoes. Uh, in athletic footwear, there's really, um, for fitness, there's walking, cross training, and running shoes. Uh, of course, you have basketball shoes and tennis shoes, but those are kind of specific sport. But for fitness, normally you're using one of those three types. What a lot of people don't know is that they are arch type specific. So if you have a high arch, certain types of shoes work well. If you have an average arch or lower arch, other types of shoes work well. If you take anything away from our conversation today is this. The ultimate goal of the shoe is to help keep all the bones stacked straight up and down. From your foot to your ankle to your knee to your hip. And the better we keep everything in alignment, the fewer aches and pains and injuries you're going to have during your workout. So think about that. So the question becomes, how do you know what your arch type is? Well, I want everybody to take their shoes off, stand up and spread out, because you're going to find <laughs> Get in position, you have to bend over, so. Maybe this is my niece, Kaylee. I think both of Ah, both. We're going to get both. I said you have to bend over, so you have to come up here or, or whatever. What I want you to do is, uh, and you stand there, get your feet maybe a little bit wider than, than shoulders apart and parallel. Even if it feels uncomfortable, um, you know, make sure they're both pointing forward. I want you to take the uh, middle finger of your right hand and bend down and see how far you can put it underneath your left arch. Can you get it just, excuse me, just a fingertip to the knuckle, past the knuckle, that type of thing? And while you're down there, do the same thing on the opposite. Take the middle finger of your left hand and see how far you can put it underneath your right arch. You may find out you have one arch a little higher than the other. Okay? You kind of know that. And the last thing what I want you to do is, if this is your ankle, you run down to your foot, I want you to run your hand from your ankle bone on the outside, straight down the side of your, your heel, down to the ground. And what you're looking for, some of you may have a little ledge out there. Okay? Pay attention to that ledge, because it is important. It's exactly right. Do both sides, because like I said, you may have one arch a little higher than the other. Okay? Once you've done all that, once you've gone to that, put your shoes back on, please. <laughs> How many here can get more than a knuckle underneath their arch? Okay. How many here can get maybe just short of a knuckle or right to the knuckle? All right. And how many here just get a finger? There you go. It'll belt in there. Okay. High, average, and low. Most of us tend to fall into that, that average arch uh, position. And this is no, there's no scientific you know, proof behind some of the things that we do here, but just experience has taught me over the years that there's certain things we look for. Um, we're all in experimental one. Okay? That's why when somebody says, well, I use an ASIC shoe, you should go out and buy an ASIC shoe. Well, that may be fine for that individual, but it may not be fine for you. So you need to somewhat experiment in the beginning to figure out what products or shoes, even accessories, or whatever works best for you. And then once you find it, try and stay with it. Okay? We found out over the 17 years of doing this that when people jump from brands to brands all the time, they tend to run into problems. 
um, especially in footwear. Because what, uh, what a lot of people don't understand about footwear is that brands determine or create loyalty by moving that arch position in the shoe, to what we call a little hump in the shoe. Um, flexibility in the shoe changes. There's a lot of different th factors that change from one brand to the next. The ride, that type of thing. So that's why I say if you find a brand and you've had some success with it, try and stay with it. You'll tend to be better off that way. Okay, so how do we know what shoe to go for? Well, in the running world, there are three categories of shoes. They're what we call neutral, stability, and motion control. Neutral, stability, and motion control. Neutral is typically for somebody that has that very high, very rigid type of foot. Those of you that can get more than a knuckle underneath your arch. Okay? These type of people tend to have, like I said, the rigid arch, rigid instep, um, maybe even supinate a little bit, which should rotate out, um, that type of thing. Uh, aches and pains that normally accumulate with this type of arch is anything almost straight up the leg. Front part of the shin, right underneath the, the kneecap, that type of thing, sometimes on the front part of the hip. Not a whole lot of pronation going on. We'll get into pronation. You have to understand what the arch is. The arch is your body's natural shock control. All right? There's a reason why it's scooped out in there. So every time you take a step, it's designed to absorb shock. And in this situation, when you have that high, very rigid type of foot, the arch isn't flexing a whole lot. So if the arch doesn't absorb the shock, then where does the shock get absorbed? Yeah. Knees, hips, right. And that's why the, the footwear becomes critical. Typically, you want a shoe that has a lot of padding, both in the heel and in the forefoot. Typically, people with high arches tend to be what we call more of a midfoot striker. They don't come down hard on the heel, they're more flat footed, maybe four footed type of thing. And that's just because of all the rigidity in their arch. So, as a result of that, you need a lot of padding both in the heel and in the forefoot. What I want you to pay attention to as I describe these, these shoes is um, the midsole. So there are three major components of a shoe you have the upper, the midsole, and the outsole. And a lot of us pay way too much attention to the upper. <laughs> it's nice, it's pretty, it's colorful, it's cute. and many of us pay way too much attention to the outsole. The outsole is a wear agent, that's all it is. It's a wear agent. It's just designed to help, you know, the durability of the shoe. But it will tell a story over time. So, like I said, the most important part of the shoe is the midsole. This is why your cushioning, all your support, your arch, you know, all, that, all that stuff is all located within the midsole component. Okay? So this is what we call a neutral shoe. If you look at the midsole, and I brought uh, just one brand, Brooks, and the reason I did that is because it's easier to transition from one from the neutral to the stability to the motion control within one brand. All brands have these three types of, of shoes. Okay? All brands have. However, not all dealers will carry them. So that's why it's critical to know what kind of arch type you have. So, neutral. We move to stability. This is a, for that person who has an average arch, can maybe just get just short of a fingertip or, or I mean a, the first knuckle or right at it type of thing. And sometimes you start to see a little bit of a bump on the outside part of the heel. Uh, what that tells me is as you went down and kind of felt the outside part of your heel, some of you may have a little bit of a ledge out there. What that means is your arch is not only falling a little bit, but the whole bone structure is split over. So as a result of that, it can put you into a misalignment position. And so, again, the ultimate purpose of the shoe is to do what? Keep everything straight up and down. Um, you'll see in the stability category that the midsole has changed here a little bit. And you see this little darker component, this little gray component they put in the stability shoe. This darker component in here is actually firmer or denser than the white material around it. So as you go through your gait cycle, and your arch collapses down, the ankle wants to pronate in or rotate in. Well, it butts up against, your foot butts up against that stability post and actually props you back up right. Okay? That's how it's all done. Um, sometimes manufacturers put a thermal plastic piece in there, which is fine. Uh, this brand just happens to put a dual density. Sometimes this density can be two and three densities, densities uh, more than the midsole of the normal shoe. So average arch, stability shoe. As you move into the third category, the motion control shoe, obviously this is for those who you can either get just a, a fingertip underneath your arch or have a flat foot. Uh, anybody here wearing orthotic at all? 
couple of you, very common. Um, here too, uh, going back to the arch, I always like to use my hand as the arch. Um, when people have a, a, a flatter foot, you know, people say, well, I have falling arches. In, in fact, that's true, but what really has happened is, since in the medical field, what's this little ligament on the bottom of your foot called? Plantar fascia. Yes. Yeah. So what's happened is the plantar connects back here underneath the heel bone and runs through the arch and splits into five for each toe. It's a, it's a spring mechanism in your foot. And this is where people get this misconception of falling arches. In fact, they got stretched out the plantar. Because as the arches flex down, the plantar wants to pull it back up. So it's that spring mechanism in your foot. The arch flexes to absorb shock, but something's going to bring it back. And that's what the plantar does. Well, if you have flat arches, then normally that plantar can stretch out. So then you need a shoe with good arch support. How do you know if a shoe is arch support? Big question. I see people do this all the time. I was out at telling my niece, I was out at Sports Authority last night, and I watched this, this 20 some year old kid doing this type of thing to see how high that hump is inside the shoe. That is not your test for arch support. Okay? Your test is actually turn the shoe over. If you need arch support, the shoe should not bend in that arch area. Sometimes you can have a shoe with a high hump in there and it'll fold right around. So that's why you have to turn the shoe over and make sure it's stiff if you need that arch. Okay? The height of the, of the bump in there, it is a component, but it's not as critical as the shoe not bending. Okay? Does that make sense at all? Because like I said, people with real flat feet, they're, it's, they're stretched out, other things are happening there, tend to overpronate. And when you get in an overpronated position, you tend to have like a knee problem, shin splints can develop, that type of thing. Plantar fasciitis uh, can be a problem, even uh, not only heel pain, Achilles problems, there's a multitude of things that can go on by having this misalignment. So what they do as they move from the stability shoe into the motion control shoe, you see the midsole changes a little bit more. You see that it not only has that darker posting in there, but this time they've actually reinforced it with some type of thermal plastic piece. It's kind of like rebar in concrete. You give you that maximum amount of support. The other thing about a motion control shoe, it also tends to be have the widest base of any of the three categories. And that's by design. Because people who have low arches or flat feet, the feet tend to spread out. So they need a wide foundation for them to, to operate on. And so they should tend to run a little wider. Also, these shoes tend to run a little deeper because they're designed to accommodate orthotics. Not all shoes are designed to accommodate orthotics. I'm sure some of you that have raised your hand who have orthotics have found over time for certain shoes it's hard to get orthotics in. And that's a fact. That just means that shoe was not designed for the application you're trying to use it. So the three different categories are neutral, stability, and motion control. You now you know more about shoes. You can work at Dick's now, sports authority. I'm sure Sports Authority is hiring. I couldn't find anybody last night. So. <laughs> anyway, so, shoes. Question. Uh, what about kids' shoes? Kids are a little tough. Um, I'm going to kind of segue into kids' shoes. Okay. Uh, the average athletic shoe is designed for 130 pound woman or 170 pound guy. Okay. And we all know that there are people in this world a little larger than that, which is fine. So you just need to make sure that the shoe you're into is designed for a person of your stature and the, and the, the you know, what you're going to use the shoe for. And how do you know that? Honestly, you won't. You won't know that. Um, if you come into our store, you know, we'll do a gait analysis, we'll measure your foot, maybe, maybe watch your walk around, something like that, and we may give you one over like this. And that's the kind of give us a feel as to the type of shoe to bring out that's going to stand up to you. Uh, you wouldn't know it by looking at me, but my dad is about 6'2", 6 6'3", 6 three bills, 300 pounds, you know. Um, he retired from this little corner retailer called Walmart. I don't know if you have heard of it. So where do you buy his shoes? Walmart. His sons own the shoe store. He gave him shoes. We had a little intervention one Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he worked out at the distribution plant in one of the warehouses in Pentagon, uh, Arkansas, which is where Walmart's headquartered. 
and his feet would hurt. Okay? And every six or eight weeks, he'd go buy a new pair. Well, when his feet hurt, who else hurts? <laughs> Can't you? Yeah, share it. Yeah? Yeah. So mom hurts. Okay? So, like I said, my brother and I would send him shoes. He never wore them. So one, one Christmas, we had a little intervention with him. We brought down four or five pairs of shoes, sat in front of his chair, took all his shoes out of the house. In fact, my sister lives down here, took all the shoes back to her house. And you can imagine the, what happened on Christmas morning. He's looking for shoes in the closet, in the washing machine, all over the house, you know, trying to find them. Finally put on a pair, and he wore them the next three or four days that we were down there. And I called Mom about a month later or so and asked him, you know, how's how he doing? Great. Those shoes that were lasting between four to six weeks to eight weeks before lasted ten months. Okay? Because a shoe is designed for a person of that stature. Conversely, you get into the children's side of it, um, those shoes are really designed for, you know, to give them a little bit of support, a little bit of cushioning at the time. Because they're going so fast, it's hard to get them into the right shoe all the time. Especially if they haven't gone through puberty. Yet. Because a lot of things can change once you go through your change. Okay, archers can even change. I've seen kids that are, have an average arch gone to high arch. Um, I've seen the opposite. So things can happen when they go through their change. So it's more important to get a shoe that's designed for their foot type, high, average, and low. Um, and in kids' shoes, typically you only have a neutral or stability. There aren't any motion control shoes for kids. Okay? Um, and as a result of that, I'd definitely get a shoe where the, the, the toe off or the upper or the outsole, I mean, is sewn on. Because the kids are always down on their knees, that type of thing, and they tear them off. And so a couple brands out there, Asics is one, where actually sew the toe on. So the less chance of actually rubbing it off. Um, and you know, once you get into size five, juniors and kids, that's actually, you can start to get into belt size. So you can migrate them from a kid's shoe into an adult shoe. And how horrible are flip flops for Obviously, they're not all good. You know, it depends if you need arch support or not. That's always a big thing. You know, there are support you know, flip flops or sandals these days, okay. which work very well. Sure. I'm kind of touch on this, but uh, I want to drill down a little bit farther. The quality of shoes that you have in peak performance, are they different than the shoes that's in the dicks? Or uh, that's a good question. Um, there's, there's no doubt, if you go to Kohl's, I'm going to put three different types of uh, distribution chains, because the manufacturer produces shoes for a certain chain. So if you go to like a Kohl's or a Sears, uh, or then to the Dicks or the Shields of the world, and then to Peak Performance, which is what we call specialty run, or specialty retailer. They do produce different types of shoes for those different types of chains, there's no doubt. That way, if you go to Kohl's, yeah, you see a lot of 30 40 and $50. Shoes. They still may say Brooks on them, or A6 or Nike, that type of thing. What they typically use are older technology, um, maybe less air, like you know, Nike uses air, so they may use less air in the air bladders, or no air, and that type of thing. Uh, a little flimsy on arch support. You might see a shoe that has a little bit of stability to it, okay? But uh, not really big on the cushioning side of it. Uh, there's almost almost a one for one to one relationship between price and cushioning, believe it or not. As you go up in price, typically cushioning goes up too. As far as arch support features and stability features, there's no correlation between price and this. So you go to Coles and get a shoe, some decent art support, maybe just a tad bit of stability, but what's it lacking? The cushioning side. So you may not end up getting the durability out of the shoe that you're looking for. Uh, when you get to the, the dicks and the, the shields of the world, um, they carry 90% of the shoes that we carry. I'll be honest with you. Um, most of the shoes that we have on our wall. There's only 10% of the shoes that we carry are only allowed for running special accounts. And the manufacturers do that on purpose because running specialty, there's only like 900 of us in the, in the country. Running specialty is kind of the tip of the sphere. We're, we're, we're out there where they do you know, hardcore running, that type of thing, and then they experiment with different technologies. Or they introduce new technology at our level. Well, like, even farther than that, like, do you get the, the same model, the 940 New Balance in your store? The 940 New Balance and um, Dix. Is it because you're at the you know the, the core of the running the hardcore running people? Like isn't the way it's constructed 
it might be a little different in terms of actually like where no. they're made and quality. No, and a 940 is a 940. Uh, what they may do is have a 4 series, let's call it a 940 and a 440. So if they have a 440, it could look a lot like the 940. That's where they take some of that stuff out of the sheet. Particularly the whatever the number is, it's across all of them. All the chains. So, yes, ma'am. Um, how do you know when you need a new pair of shoes? Because obviously, when, when I get a new pair of shoes, I'm like, oh. It's so much better than the other ones. But I always wonder, oh, I wonder if I should have replaced those, you know, well, when, months when, ago. When, so, when or, you, get, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you get to the upper end, they get this little thermometer thing that pops out. I so know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good question. It's a very good question. Um, number one, Ace, all, all, all running shoes are designed for about four to 500 miles. I should say all, but most shoes are designed for about four, about four to 500 miles of and obviously not, a lot of us don't keep a log, as how many miles we use them a day, that type of thing. So there's things you have to kind of look out for. Uh, first, aches and pains. The number one cause of aches and pains typically is an old shoe. So if you get back from a run or walk one day and just feel a little more beat up than normal, or you get up in the morning feeling a little more beat up than normal, look at your shoe. And what you need to look at is actually the midsole, right here. Like I said, this is where I support and all your Christian resides. Uh, if you look at the midsole and find out there are compression ridges, because this is foam, if you compress this enough, you'll get these ridges in the midsole. So if you get down with your runner walk and you find out that it'll beat up more than normally, you look at the shoe and you find out these ridges are very deep and pronounced, it's probably time to start looking for the pair of shoes. Okay? Second, pay attention to the ridges. If the ridges are parallel to the ground, that typically means the shoe's losing cushion. Okay? If the ridges on the inside part of the shoe, the medial side of the shoe, are at a 45 degree angle to your arch, and you'll see those, that probably means the shoe did not have enough arch stability, I mean, to begin with. So that means you're over pronating that shoe now. And the third thing, uh, although it doesn't uh, determine the length of the shoe, but look at the wear pattern on the shoe, on the outsole. Ideally, we all heel strike on the outside part of the heel, then should come down the center part of the shoe and go right off the toe off. And believe it or not, the toe-off is actually your second toe, it's not your big toe. That's the ideal thing. So, outside heel, down the center part of the shoe. That's where your wear, wear pattern should be. If you find out your wear pattern is more off your big toe, then there's probably not enough stability in that shoe. You can overcome it. Okay? If you find out your wear pattern is on the outside, well then, the shoe may be breaking down laterally. So it may, not, may be too supportive, or something else is going on that's causing you to break down laterally. So pay attention to that. So when you go looking for a shoe, always bring your old one with you. Because to us, this is an x-ray. This tells a story. And not only from the compression points and outsole, we'll take the insert out. This is a sock liner. Um, this tells a story too, because it tells how the, the pressure point of your foot is on the shoe. Some of us will have a big pressure point right in the middle of the ball of the foot. Some of us will have a big pressure point off the big toe. Some of us will have toes that grab and actually dig in out here. And all those are telling us the story as to what's going on in your foot and how it operates with your shoe. So, very good question. Any other questions? Yes? Um, the shoes, I haven't seen um, the new craze for whatever. Is the natural? Yes, those. Okay, you're getting it. No, it's okay. Go ahead and answer your question. <laughs> I, I guess I just, your thoughts on those. Um, I think that was one of the new things that people have said that suggested that your feet actually get stronger. And I know mine helped me a lot, but it's hard to run in them. Um, what she talk, she is talking about. They call natural. Yeah, uh, it's it's the minimalistic movement. This born to run book that came out a number of years ago and talked about uh, uh, wearing no shoes for running or barefoot running or or minimalistic type shoes. Um, you ever hear of anything called knee jerk reaction? <laughs> <laughs> it's like anything. You put enough passion behind something, it'll sell. Okay, um, these are definitely an experiment of one. As you find out, you may work well for you, but your friend it may not work well for her at all. Okay, and that's fine. Uh, I'll be honest with you. For every ten we sell, only nine of them will never be run. The other nine, the nine will be used for like cross training or going to the gym or rock climbing. You'd be amazed or just yeah. casual type of use. Uh, the one that gets used for running, it's a 50-50 bet on whether you get hurt or not. And that's been our result of what's been happening. Um, a lot of people jumped into this because it does make some sense. 
even if you talk to the tr traditional shoe companies, it does make some sense. Number one, physics, weight. Obviously, these are lightweight, so the less the shoe weighs, the less you have to pick up and put down. You know, in the course of a marathon, it's 38,000 steps. A lot. You know? <laughs> 38,000 steps in a, in a marathon, okay, think how many times you have to pick up a shoe that weighs 10 ounces or 12 ounces over that course of that, over that distance, okay? So it does make some sense. Um, the natural feel of feeling the ground, that tactile type of response gives you foot a sensation needs to do other things. So yeah, it does help with the sensation and, and responsiveness to how, how the foot should operate, that type of thing. But that's kind of the end of it. Um, where it breaks down is that in civilization, since we've had pyramids and so forth, we've gone to flat. If you look at the foot and all the bones in the foot, you find out there's 26 bones in the foot and they're designed for, for terrain. All right? They're really not designed for flat surface. But we've been living on flat surfaces for so long. And as a result of that, then some of the muscles and tendons, like I said, don't get worked as like they should. That's why some, that some people benefit from it because it goes back to the sensation. Um, it's been proven, 50 years of research has proven that a 10 millimeter difference between your heel height and your forefoot height is your strongest balanced position. That's why most shoes have that higher heel on. Okay, it's been proven. That's fact. That's been research that's been done for a long, long time. Uh, and cushioning. Like I said, if the shoe doesn't absorb the shock, and the arch doesn't absorb the shock, then your body has to absorb the shock. So there's this knee jerk reaction that started out, the crazy hip. And all of a sudden, the crazy just plummeted. But what has happened is it woke these guys up, the, the traditional shoe companies up. And so they come out with a hybrid between these two. So the Pure line from Brooks, for example, or the 33 line from, from Asics, or the Lunar line from Nike are all in that, that I wouldn't call it minimalistic, but minimal category. They tried to lower the heel down a little bit, but still give some cushioning. Uh, take certain features like overlays out of the shoe, that type of thing, to get rid of some of the weight, that type of thing. So, and I think those are here to stay. We're, we're finding people get a lot of, are getting a lot of success from those. Good question. Yes? Um, how do you feel, I've heard several different things about <coughs> if you run a lot, having a separate set of shoes for running and a separate set of shoes for when you walk around and not trans your running shoes into your walking shoes. Yes, you need that retail. <laughs> 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 no, you're right. Yeah, it, it'd be nice if you could designate one shoe just for your running. And, and it's okay to have two or three different pairs of running shoes. Um, you know, a lot of people will. That way they transition from one shoe to the next. Um, anybody here train for a marathon at all? Half marathon. Half? Half? Uh, typically, I suggest, you know, in your training process, you get a new pair about two to three weeks out of your event. Even though your old shoe is not done, uh, that way you're, you're putting your longer miles in the new shoe, and then actually running the event in the new shoe. The reason for that is I can't tell you how many times you see people get injured in the late stages, or even during the event, because their shoe is done. Okay? So that's why it's nice to transition to a new shoe when you have that time. But yeah, I mean, it's we all have a lot of things that we manage to get look pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about footwear? Yes. What about trail running? Um, a lot of trail shoes. Unfortunately, we don't have many traditional trails around here. Uh, so in in our realm of the woods, uh, it's it's the normal trail shoes you'll see around here would be um, a traditional running shoe, and they may have put a a tougher upper on it, for example, would be water resistant, something like that. And maybe a slightly more aggressive outsole. But still, you're going to see trail shoes that are stability and neutral. Okay. Now, if you get into like the mountain areas, uh, you'll see running running stores out there will have more of the Mon Trails or the um, I think a couple of the other brands, more of the traditional trail running shoes. And those typically are a little heavier. They have skid plates on the bottom. The midsoles tend to be a little thicker because you don't want a stick or a rock to poke through the bottom. But oftentimes it's. It seems good. I just have one about um, no shoes actually. 
how does there's a kickboxing class that I go to and I get it for when we're keeping the bag. So there's a lot of cardio that we do, and we don't wear. She doesn't let us wear shoes in that class, and that actually does not feel great on my feet. Is that very just per person? Yeah, that will vary so, per person per person. Uh, and again, that's where you experiment. You may be able to get by something like this. This shoe, for example, is one of these. It has about the toe. So you may be able to get by with something like that. Just keep it a little bit. Because, you know, for me, my feet are so sensitive. I can't walk out of the mailbox to get the mail barefoot. It's actually faster for me to sit down and tie up my shoes and walk out. <laughs> well, I'm assuming it has to do with shock, but... And it can. Oh, that can. Okay. Anything else in shoe? You mentioned... Um, earlier that you could uh, buy those shoes at like Shoe Mills or mm -hmm. Sports Authority, the first day that you showed. Is there a comparable price between what you can find at the store? Well, the, the benefit of the internet is mm -hmm. it has actually smoothed out the pricing. Uh, manufacturers now have, on the retailing side, I'm talking about the retail, talking, talking about We have mapping policies we have to follow. So you may be able to find this shoe at Shields, and it may be $5 off, but that's probably the most expensive. Okay, unless, unless a new version has come out, and then they can drop it. The old one, I mean, so. so that's the benefit of the internet. You know, that's one of the benefits that we had on our store. Last one, where is your store? Uh, we actually have three in town. Our main store to here is 78th and Cass. It's over the Keystone Trail over there. We have a store in Bellevue in the Twin Creek area, and then a store at 156 and Dodge. Um, we're going to move on to socks. So, do you uh, answer my question about why we should not wear socks or cotton? <laughs> Anybody? Why should why we should not wear cotton? If you are physically active, you should not wear cotton. What does cotton do with moisture? Absorb. That's right. That's good. And this one. How long does it take the cotton sock to dry or towel to dry? Okay. That's the management property that the cotton does not possess. Um, we have some socks that will almost come out of the washer dry. They hate moisture that much. And the drier you keep your feet, the less chance of getting blisters, even callus buildup, uh, hot feet, that type of thing. All because the properties these socks have. Of course, they're synthetic. So cotton absorbs moisture, and in that moisture is also the heat. And that's why when, the, when the, a wicking sock releases the moisture, it releases the heat along with it, or cotton can't do that. So normally you'll run five to, or exercise five to seven degrees hotter in cotton than you will in some type of functional piece. Then of course, if you're wearing a cotton t-shirt and you're sweating, what happens to the t-shirt? It's wet, it's heavy. You know, that type of thing. So yeah, so they actually get hotter in a cotton piece than you go on any functional piece. So cotton's a great piece for casual techniques. Okay, it's soft, that type of thing. But if you're going to be active and are susceptible to getting blisters or chafing or stuff of that nature, you may want to check what you're wearing. Because um, blisters are caused by three things. Friction. When you get friction, you get what? Heat. And then the body wants to do what as it heats up? That's right. So it's that constant cycle of friction, heat, and moisture is what causes the blister. And then, of course, the cotton will what? Pill? You get those little balls on it, that type of thing. Well, that acts like sandpaper against your skin. So uh, that's why we highly recommend you stay away from cotton. Uh, if you are highly susceptible to blisters, believe it or not, they're what we call double layer socks out there. Sometimes, I don't know, many years ago when I played basketball in high school, coaches said, we're two pairs of socks. Well, that's still the two layers we grew up on each other. Well, now, modern science, they actually have a sock with two layers. It's still pretty thin. And it has the cool max material, which is a moisture wicking drying material. It was designed to wick the moisture away. But yet, the two layers will rub on each other. So if you're highly susceptible to getting blisters, this is the one way to go. Are they seamless? Uh, pretty much. Pretty much. That's the seam on the top. Uh, and then also, uh, a lot of socks should be a fitted sock, meaning that uh, when you look at the heel, they're going to have some type of Y construction in the heel. That way, if it fits the heel better, it won't slide around as much. Um, so, kind of pay attention to this. 
This is one of your best friends. And of course, a lot of different types of material. I'm sure you heard of Bifid, of course, um, uh, Cool Max, Audi Cool. There's a lot. Every brand has their own kind of proprietary type of moisture wicking material. Most important is that you can. Yes, ma'am. What do you think about the high socks? Um, we see a lot of people running in the. Um, compression. Like, well, like the cap. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it, compression is big these days. And I don't have to tell you, people in the medical field, compression has been around for 40, 50 years. So there's been a lot of, you know, science done behind it and proven um, aspects behind using compression. Well, it's only been the last two or three years that they found out, hey, it works if you're athletic too. It helps with what? Promote blood, yeah, fluid, that type of thing, you know, all that stuff. Um, so they work very well. If you have somebody that uh, has a circulatory problem, not only on the medical side, but if, they, if they're athletic or work out, you still wear an athletic compression type sock or sleeve which means there's no footy in it, it's just a sleeve, that uh, works very, very well. Yeah, very good question. Um, a lot of, well, more people should be using this, honestly. Um, they won't be as sore, especially if you're doing long stuff or working out hard. Uh, they won't be as sore, they'll recover quicker, that type of thing. Good question. Um, we'll talk about apparel next, since we're on soft stuff. Talked about cotton, and uh, this is a cool. Uh, this actually manufactures this, this is a New Balance here. Um, so it's a form of Cool Max that New Balance uses. I would say it's a it's a functional material designed to wick the material out. And the reason I brought these pieces is because I've got a kind of a winter wear or a December wear piece for men, and then a winter wear piece for women, and they're a little different. Um, Men's, all of us shorts these days will have some type of reef inside, some type of lining. And again, this is where cotton come, can be a problem because it can cause a lot of chafing. So if you wear your cotton briefs and you go for a run and you come back and get in the shower and go, oh, that stings out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's happening. Okay. Um, so uh, running shorts these days, a lot of workout shorts actually have a brief inside. If you like a little more coverage, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, like boxer type briefs you can get into shorts on too. So you get a little more coverage down the leg, you know, which is also less chafing that way too. But again, the material is a functional material designed to dry very quickly. Likewise on the top, okay? You'll find out that uh, I love winter running better than summer. Because this is stuff. <laughs> winter stuff. Anybody run yesterday afternoon? Yes. Did you enjoy it? Yes. Yes, I did too. I did. You know, yesterday it was cold, you know, um, 25, 26 or so at 4 o'clock when I went running with my dog. And I run around Lake Strinsky. There's maybe me and another two people out there. And the reason why people don't go out is because it's cold. And part of it is uh, you don't like to get cold. But if you ran comfortably, I assume you're probably dressed properly. I said I had one of my best runs all winter. Um, and that even beats the run I had two weeks ago when it was 70 degrees up. Uh, and it's all in how I was dressed. In winter running, and typically in the uh, Omaha area, it's a three layer system. Remember this the most important layer you put on is the first layer, it's the base layer. This is, again, stay away from cotton. This is where you want the, the moisture to be moved away from your skin as quickly as possible. Okay? And this is where you can have fun with it. You can do whatever. You, know, you put one hand on there. But if you like long sleeve, short sleeve, that works fine. Uh, there's nothing that says you can't wear a summer piece as your base layer in winter because these are also designed to wick the moisture away. The only downside of this is that summer pieces don't have the thermal quality always as the winter pieces do. So you may lose some heat if you're trying to use a summer piece as a base layer, which is fine. Um, but this is where you start, your first layer you put on. Believe it or not, the second most important layer in winter is actually the, the outside shell. This is where you want to either be wind and waterproof or highly wind and water resistant. You want the shell to block that cold air from penetrating through, but yet you don't want it to be Gore-Tex. Gore-Tex is really not breathable. You want material that is designed to actually allow a little bit, a little bit of air to penetrate through to dry material underneath it and then allow the heat vapor to escape out. Otherwise you can overheat. Okay? 
So this is where you want to wind or waterproof or highly wind and water resistant. The question is, how do you know if it is wind or waterproof? Sometimes they'll say it on the package, sometimes they won't. Here's a little test. That's all you have to do. Just put your hand in the sleeve and blow. You know, put your mouth over it and see how hard you can blow through it. You find out, I can feel just a little bit going through there, but mostly it's not. Now, some pieces you do that too, you'll just feel your breath right away. So that tells you right then and there how, how wind and waterproof it is. Okay? So the second most important piece is the shell. Like the third, and this is where people experiment, is what we call the insulated layer. This is the, the second layer you put on. This is where the polar techs, the fleeces, and things like that come into to, to work. Air is still the best insulator there is. Okay? So these pieces are not only designed to wick the moisture away, keep the moisture flowing from inside out, but also they're designed to retain the heat in the, in the fibers. Okay? So that helps you keep that warmth next to your body. But yet, you don't want to overheat or get excessively you know, too much sweat or moisture in there, so it still allows the moisture to move on out. Um, there are new technologies developed now that uh, uh, actually one brand is called Mizuno. As the moisture gets wet, it actually heats up. It's a thermal property they developed. And it works very well. That's why I wore it yesterday. Um, it worked very well. So, base layer, insulative layer, and then a shell. And again, it doesn't matter if you, same thing for headpieces, hands and you know, hands, feet, that type of thing. It's all, you know, stay away from that cotton. Um, like wearing in pants, uh, whether you like tights these days or running pants, you know. And here you can actually run a little cooler because your legs create a lot of heat. So you can maybe only go one layer, some type of, of short, running short or wind brief or something underneath it, and then the tight would so, how do you know if it works? Well, yesterday, maybe this happened to you, sir, because it's cold enough. Yesterday, when I got running, I had frost on my shoulders. Frosty buildup. It's one of those rare things that happen on occasion. And what that tells me is the moisture is coming from inside out, and when it hit the air temperature, it froze on the surface. But yet, I was perfectly warm. And then uh, when I get in the house, I'm just getting ready to take my jacket off, steam coming up through the jacket. So that's how you know it works. Okay? So, like I said, one of my best runs of all winter was yesterday, and it was cold. So that's apparel. Questions on apparel? Yes, ma'am. Do you know anything about sports bras? A little bit. <laughs> no, I know. I know. I know what the point you're trying to make. I'm a guy. Yeah. I don't wear it in public. I know. Um, support. And I just use this piece right here just as an example. Imagine this being raw. Um, obviously, a lot of it depends on your size. And there's um, what's nice with sports bras these days. They are coming fitted. With not only chest size but cup sizes too, which is good. A lot of you know, years in the past, it just made small, medium, large, and so it's harder to, to fit. But obviously, your support should be up and down. Okay, so you need to grab the material and see where it's stretching and where it's supporting. Um, there's no doubt. There's tests you can do if you go try one on somewhere. You know, take it into the, the fitting booth and try it on, and jump up and down, and do all kinds of things to see how it's going to work, and that's fun. Okay. Some bras will have extra support features and adjustable straps, okay, to help with all the support you can get uh, for larger women. Um, you should definitely look at something that has where the, 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 the band is around your, your chest should be seam sealed, so you don't want any rough seams out there to cause any irritation. Um, you know, for women, it tends to be under the arms and over the shoulders tend to be at two hot spots. And so there you want to stay away from cotton again. You want a cool max or dry fit or some type of functional material in those areas. And then make sure that the seams are sealed so you don't have the seams rubbing on you too. So there's an explanation. Um, there's a product out there. We sell sports slick, but there's another one called Body Glide. This is your best friend. If you do have blisters or chafing or irritation, that type of thing, this is something you can put on the spots. Okay? It would be on your feet, between your legs, on your arms, on your shoulders, wherever. It just helps. It, it creates a slick surface for that, for that friction to take place. 
That way you won't, you won't get irritated and get sore and stuff like that. Like I said, how do you know if you have a spot? Well, if you're working out and get in the shower and go, wow. You know, that's where your spots are. It's amazing what water does to those spots. Mm -hmm. um, but this is something you can get just to put on. Okay? If you have a blister and it's popped open, you can put it right over top of it. It's medicated. It's antibacterial, so um, it helps with the healing process. Never use Vaseline. I repeat that. Never use Vaseline. I saw it again the other day. Vaseline will write on the surface, but will not penetrate the skin. So when you rub it off, you can actually blister underneath it. Okay? And this guy's training for a spring marathon, so now he's in his 12 and 14 mile runs, and he had a blister, and so he put the on one guy one day, and the next day, he's going out for another long run, puts some Vaseline on it, the blister popped open, the Vaseline caused the infection. Because it's not medicated. Okay? Now I know the Vaseline products have a medicated brand now because for that. So if you want to use Vaseline, make sure it is a medicated side, but the old fashioned Vaseline you never use it because it's not medicated. Okay? Uh, a couple of fun things. You know what this is? It's too rough you your boss and rub yeah. the bruises out so no one knows. Do you have the foam holders too? Uh, we're getting them. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is called a stick. It's a massage stick. And like she was saying, if you get back from workout, you should you know, rub the muscle down. Help get the lactic acid built up out of that area. Um, this is also one of your best friends. This is one of those things you put in your toolkit. Whether you're a triathlete or a runner or whatever, it just helps. It just helps with the, the recovery process. And you can get them, get some with little nubs on them and all kinds of stuff. Remember, the, the smoother the surface, the, I should say, the rougher the surface, the deeper it'll go. So if you really want to penetrate deep, you get the ones with the big nubs on them, you'll really penetrate deep. So. That's called the stick. Um, if you do a lot of halves or, or marathoning or even fun around town, it's what they call a spy belt. It's a little carrier that's been developed over the last few years. And it's a belt that does not bounce up and down. It actually stays pretty steady. But it's uh, expandable, so you put your phone or iPod in there, or phone and camera, or a roll of $100 bills like you carry. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can put it in there, and it won't bounce up and down. You can also add two little toggles to it to make you your race belt. So that way you don't pin the race belt to your $50 piece of material. <laughs> Um, they work very well, and you'll see a lot of them. Hydration. This is probably an area that everybody knows about, but a lot of people don't do enough about. A lot of us tend to be dehydrated. Either we're drinking too much pop or coffee or something. You know, the diuretic is going through us already, so we're already dehydrated. And then when you go out and exercise, you do what? You sweat more, so you dehydrate yourself more. And so when they talk to you about drinking those six to eight pint glasses of water a day, to some of you that may not be enough. Okay? Uh, if you're at the starting line of some event someday and your mouth is dry, you are hosed. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot get enough water in your system over the next two or three hours to hydrate you. Okay? Hydration is a process that takes days. So if you're training for a marathon, hydration typically will start seven to ten days out if you're if you've been dehydrated, okay? Because you're gonna lose all that. So ways of carrying it with you. If you don't have access to it, of course you can have some type of belt that'll carry it with you. Um, it's nice to have the little bottles that where you just pop it with your mouth and you just open it and, and close it or just squeeze it automatically. And a nice holster where it just goes in and out pretty quickly. Um, you do wear this behind you. Like this. I've seen people wear it like this, but sometimes it'll interrupt with your so you wear it behind you, okay? And you wear it low. Both these belts, you wear it low as on your hips as you can get. The reason for that is the higher you get it, the more it'll bounce, and it may interfere with your breathing. So when you're running, you want to breathe all the way through your lungs, so that means your stomach should come out as you breathe. A lot of runners tend to be high breathers. <laughs> Only use the, maybe the top quarter, top third of their lungs. And so if you're running with your, I'll just pick on you two ladies, it looks like you run together. <laughs> well, if you're running along and, and she's going, oh, I'm doing well today, and you're going, <laughs> there's a good chance you're probably not breathing all the way through. Okay. 
breathe, dang it. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, some of the products. Um, questions? Can you um, talk to the chancellor to get us some extra money so that we can have the money to afford to purchase? <laughs> <laughs> I feel your pain. Because it's um, like, yeah, I feel like I have to get stuck in mortgage on some of this stuff. I, and I'm not going to dispute that at all. But I, I will tell you something that I have pieces. Tricks of the trade, maybe. Yeah, I have pieces. If you, if you buy one or two pieces a year over a couple of years, you'll be fine. Because what happens is these things don't wear out. So I've got pieces that are 10 and 12 years old. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I may have paid $40 for them 10 years ago, but I still wear them today. So what's the life value of that piece? Okay, so yeah, it may be a little more, may cost you more going in, but you'll get the benefit of the long term. Um, matter of fact, my wife yeah, laughs at me because I got a few pieces I named. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't so long. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank We're very good? Thank you. going to hand out some coupons here for you, um, and uh, as you as you go along in your training, uh, you know, don't hesitate to give us a call if you have any problems or aches or pains, that type of thing. Um, if anybody has any issues right now, they want to stay a little longer to talk about it, they have to talk to you about it. But uh, always remember, um, you are an athlete. Your body may not know it yet, but you are an athlete. <laughs> so if he wants to be moved, just keep moving. Thank you.